All right. Um, so yeah, thank you again, Jeff. Um, believe it or not, even with the rise of AI, especially this year, we do still need to talk to each other. And there's still a lot to learn from the ways we talk to each other, and even the ways we interact with our systems, with our technologies. Um, you know, I know it was mentioned on call earlier. How many of you are on call right now? Okay. How many of you have been in or managed an urgent situation or incident before? How many of you have been affected by an incident before? This week? Okay. <laughs> Hopefully no one's in one right now, but... <laughs> um, so I'm Nora. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of Jelly.io, which is an end-to-end -end incident management platform. Uh, and it's really nice to be back here. I grew up here right, right in uh, Fairfax, Virginia, so it's really nice to be at a local community event. Um, I've worked at Netflix, Slack, Jet.com. I've lived in a bunch of different places, and as Jeff mentioned, I've written a couple books on chaos engineering and how an organization's ability to purposely inject failure is actually a competitive and business advantage. Um, I've ended up keynoting at um, Re AWS reInvent to a audience of 60,000 people about chaos engineering, and I've ended up making a business about studying incidents and communication and helping orgs learn from them when they have a lot of other stuff going on, when they have a whole other business to run. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here today. This is just a little screenshot of kind of what we do in Jelly. We really help you reduce the coordination costs and learn from your incidents, but with a huge focus on the humans involved in them and how things made sense at the time and how things can improve in the future. So we're all here because, you know, I, I am curious, like if I asked everyone in the room, what does DevOps mean in 2023? I'm curious how many different answers I would get. <laughs> right, these communities, these DevOps days communities have been amazing and they started quite a, quite a long time ago. And DevOps has evolved so, so much and all of our roles have evolved so much too. What DevOps means to the companies we do is very different. Um, you know, we're having to not get too clung to titles, but instead paying attention to what our business is act asking of us and what the industry needs. Um, and there's a lot you can do about, uh, learn about in your organization to study and influence the way it operates through looking at its communications. And I'm mentioning incidents a lot because a really great way to understand how your organization communicates and talks to each other is to look at how it communicates and talks to each other in the middle of an incident because that cadence is different. You know, people move faster, there's, there is learning involved, but sometimes it's a little bit less. You're just trying to do what you can to get the thing fixed. Um, so what else is happening in the industry right now? Companies are in transition places all over the tech industry. They, they might be struggling financially, um, and AI is obviously influencing everything. We're still having incidents and situations, sometimes even more so. Um, and now is the moment you'll get time after incidents to show what can be learned from them and how that can be applied to what your businesses are experiencing. So learning from incidents and learning from the communication in incidents asks us not why the incident happened or why something unfolded. It asks us why did it make sense for us to do it this way. In the incident, before the incident, what led up to the incident. And those things can improve and influence so much in our organizations. So um, I'm going to actually ask uh, the industry today, why did it make sense for us to do it this way? How did we get here so that we can be better now and beyond? I, I've worked at a lot of different companies. I've had to do incident command at different companies. I have customers that do incident command at different companies. It is, it's a lot of work and a lot of the time after the incident is done, we don't take a lot of time to look at how we communicate, and I get it. You didn't plan for the incident, so you have other things that you need to go do. Um, so part one of this talk, I'm gonna talk about developing expertise, uh, and then I'm gonna go through a tale of two incident investigations and what you can learn from them through looking at the communication patterns. And then let's talk about what's next. So, Let's talk about the genesis of expertise amongst individuals. And to do that, we're gonna go through a fictional company. So this company is pre-product market fit, not a lot of users, 
Not a lot of employees, not a lot of incidents. All the companies we worked at started this way. Um, but they did have things they needed to coordinate on. They had decisions they needed to make. They had ways they needed to communicate about those decisions. And those things that they're doing impact everything going forward. They impact your role now. And so um, I creatively named the four people that work there, person A, B, C, and D. And um, you know, hypothetical situation, um, we have to get something done, right? We have to roll it out to customers. We have to see how it's going to go. Maybe we don't have customers yet. And person A says, I saw this really cool new technology uh, to make this project go faster. I think it's really going to set us up for success in the long run. Um, and I, I run a startup. This happens every day at our startup, too, even though we do incident management. And person B says, uh, OK, if it gets us there faster and more reliably, let's do it. Does this situation sound familiar to anyone, like at a high level? Yeah. Person C says, is it easy to use? I'm not really familiar with it. So person C, you know, kind of being the voice of reason, right? Like, I'm probably going to have to manage this at some point. Person A says, I will teach you all. It's fairly straightforward. Um, and I don't know if, um, if any of you all play video games when there's like a new boss or new challenger approaching, but we actually have a new expert approaching. Person A, for the length of their tenure at this company, is now in charge of this technology, whether they know it or not. Um, so person A now becomes the expert. Um, person B and person C develop some semblance of expertise about the technology. And person D is busy doing other things. And there's really not more than three people needed to understand it. Um, so months pass. Um, that feature that new technology was used for was a huge success. Yay. Um, and the business was doing so well, is doing so well, and is generating huge demand for the product. And now we get to hire a lot more people, right? Uh, and the expertise of person B and person C actually slowly evaporates, and it's kind of back in person A again. And there's a thousand things to ramp up on, and new technology is just one of them. Um, the usage of new technology is also expanding uh, as we're hiring more people, right? And so while person A thinks they have the expertise in new technology, or person B and person C think that person A has all this expertise, they actually don't have all of this expertise anymore because the system has changed quite a bit. And this is the danger territory, right, where everyone kind of assumes we sort of know, or I can keep it all in my head. But I actually can't because my system's gotten a lot more complex. And when I say system's gotten a lot more complex, we have tripled the size of the organization at this point. Um, so most of the people in this org chart start to have little, to, little deep knowledge of each other's areas or each other's um, sharpens, right? Uh, so we think of like a blunt and a sharpened, uh, which is from uh, Richard Cook's um, famous image, which I can share at the end of this talk. But the blunted is what we see with, with what people do, and the sharpened is like their actual expertise, all the details and the nitty gritty of what they do. Um, so person A says, OK, I'll be the expert again, and everyone around them assumes the same. But here's what's actually happening, right? So new technology is now so much bigger, and person A actually knows a chunk of it. And so I want to share David, David Woods' theorem. He says, as the complexity of a system increases, the accuracy of any single agent or single person's own model of that system decreases uh, very rapidly, like faster than we actually even know, and faster than our colleagues know, too. Um, and so um, we try to like you know keep person B and person C and a few other people up to date on some of these new technologies, and then another incident occurs with new technology, and person C is first on the scene. They haven't looked at or seen new technology in a few years, you know, well before we hired all of these people, uh, and so they bring in all these other people, and all these people are kind of starting to work on the incident together, and sometimes they're they're. They're really starting to find out things about each other, about the work that's being done, about the depth of knowledge that we have about the system in the middle of the incident, uh, which is very stressful. And so the incident wraps up, and an incident review happens, but we're very busy. So it only involves a small group of people, and it's done hastily, and some experts cannot make the incident review. 
namely person A. Person A cannot make the incident review, which is the person that actually has the most context on this part of the system too. And then management gets a high-level report with high-level metrics and indicators on the incident and some sort of explanation on why it's not gonna happen again, even though we all know it might happen again. Um, and we're not really focused on understanding how it was possible. We're not really focused on understanding the different pockets of this expertise and how they all fit together. We're not focused on understanding how the people that we brought into the incident knew what they knew and worked with the other people to help them know what they know. Parties engaged in incident response have different goals and priorities. And the more complex an incident is, there's a lot of different people in it, right? And I know we're a room of, of mostly DevOps professionals, right? But there's customer success, there's sales, there's your, your board, there's your customers, there's your engineers. Everyone is having to communicate in some way in and about the incident, and sometimes to all of those different people at the same time. And it gets really complex. And I think in most organizations, those five different types of people are not talking together about the incident after it occurs. They're not always in the incident review together. They're sometimes still in those pockets. And so over time, what ends up happening is this expertise dwindles, and worse, people aren't totally aware that it's dwindling. And over time, person A is actually involved in almost every single incident that involves new technology. They're incredibly valuable to the organization. They have a rich skill set. This is not the only thing they have expertise in. And as they manage this technology, the organization grows and grows, and more people are hired around them with limited knowledge themselves. And person A also has a lot going on. They don't have time to teach people all the ins and outs of new technology, and so they keep responding to incidents because it's easier uh, to respond to it and just do it themselves than moving on to do other things. And I see organizations get into this trap a lot. They put it on person A to teach everyone else, rather than helping teach everyone else to extract things from person A, to watch them, to understand what they were looking at, to understand what graphs they put up in an incident. And the thing is, the types of people like person A, and maybe some of you are person A, right? Maybe this, maybe this resonates with you. I'm sure you all know one is they are inherently very bad <laughs> at teaching people about what makes them an expert because they're kind of so far removed from it that they forget what it's like to be a beginner. And some of these things are so obvious to them, and so it's actually very hard to explain it. And so we use this technique um, at Jelly, and I've used it at a few different organizations I've worked at called cognitive questioning, which can help you unearth what makes an expert an expert. Uh, help them unearth what they were doing at the time, what they were hearing, what they were thinking, why they jumped in. All these types of questions can um, really bubble up to the surface what makes them good at what they do, which helps you build more of those types of people. And you can't meaningfully improve the expertise of people without looking at the cognitive work, without looking at how they knew what to do what they did, without knowing at what they pulled up, without knowing at what they said, you know? Um, sometimes even just like, looking at a, a Slack transcript or a Zoom transcript after the incident and seeing the words UG from an expert. Like, it seems so innocuous, but it actually, it's really good to push on. Like, hey, James, why did you say that? Like, what was actually going through your head at that particular time? That kind of stuff is the important work that's actually going to help our organizations. It's gonna help us not overhire. It's gonna help incidents be easier. It's not gonna make them go away but it's gonna make them a more normal part of work. But this is itself work. And I sometimes see it avoided a lot of the time because it's awkward, right? It's, it's hard <laughs> to ask someone, oh, why did you do this thing here? Or how did you do it, right? And if you don't have this trusting relationship with them, or maybe in, you're in a remote organization, it can be a little bit harder. Like, oh no, this isn't coming from like my opinion on like why did you push the big red button that said don't push. I'm just, I'm just wondering <laughs> what was going through your mind when you did that. And there are ways that you can word these questions that take the other person off of the defensive and actually get you an honest answer. And there's ways you can display to them these questions that actually get that for you too. Um, you know, saying things like I don't know this, asking someone for clarification, telling someone they're wrong, not being sure, having your boss loitering around, or even being a boss loitering around. 
These are all things that happen and we have to like work through them and not just avoid them. And I see a lot of orgs avoid them by just kind of summarizing a timeline in an incident and taking all the names out. And they, you know, I see a lot of orgs being like, well, that means it's blameless if we don't have any of the names in there. And I'm like, but everyone can go look up who, who did these things. Like, right, we have access to GitHub, we have access to Slack. Like, it's almost making it actually a little bit more difficult. And I, I actually really encourage if your organization is doing that to look at some of the dynamics of it, right? And sometimes it's not as psychologically safe in certain organizations to do that. So there's stuff to be worked on there before actually inputting the raw data. So part two, um, a tale of two incident reviews. And I'm gonna go a little deep technically with this just to illustrate a point and we're gonna go through like an actual incident. Um, and so I'm gonna be taking you through a semi-true account of two incidents uh, and spoiler alert, they're actually the exact same incident. Um, and this was an incident I was involved in and tasked to do a review of uh, at another point uh, in my career. And it came, it really helped me underscore the value of studying cognitive work and communication through the lens of incidents. Um, and I, um, in this first investigation, I will take you through the first incident review for this. This first incident review was actually completed by person A in this situation. So we can see what it's like when person A, who's very busy and does have the deep expertise, does the incident review. And then the second incident review was done by an outside party, extracting details from various people. Um, so, investigation one, seemingly innocuous incident that didn't have much customer impact and didn't deserve or have time for a thorough postmortem or incident review. Uh, templated approach, completed by the members of the team most involved in the incident. Purpose was to file and report. And the template kind of looked like this. Summary, impact, detection, resolution, detailed summary, contributing factors, timeline, what went well, what went wrong, how we got lucky, and action items. This probably looks really familiar to several people. I don't recommend doing timeline, or doing post-incident reviews this way. This is my hot take. People usually don't read these. <laughs> people usually don't spend a lot of effort on them. The purpose is kind of to file and report rather than to be read. And if things aren't being read and engaged with and communicated around, are we actually learning? Are we actually uh, improving expertise? And are we actually improving our systems? Um, we don't really know how much time was spent on this document. We don't know who read it. We don't know who attended the meeting or if there was a meeting. We don't know what the purpose of the stock was. And we don't know what was actually difficult about the handling of the incident itself. We know nothing about the midst of the incident, right? And that is actually where a lot of the meat that we can learn from is, is what handling the incident looked like. So this was the summary for investigation one. It says, a change was made to some of the search infrastructure tooling that updates which search index to look at each day. We were able to recreate the issue and soon after it had been reported, engineering was able to track down the problem and fix the bad configuration. Due to the nature of the bug, no pre-processing work had to be done for search to be functional again. Um, and I should mention the company I'm talking about is a fictional e-commerce company. So you can have that in your head a, a bit. Um, and then we have a bit more of a detailed summary talking about how the search index is actually split into collection. There's one for older SKUs, which for those that don't, uh, haven't worked in e-commerce, that means stock keeping unit. And then, um, two to three collections for recent SKUs, one per day for newly created SKUs. Each collection be, can be individually submitted for reading and writing, um, and then search collections uh, are, are all typically read for a given vendor. And then there's a read alias, which lets us query from as many collections using one name. Daily collections are created, which are typically done two days in advance that they're added to the read alias. And then there was a bug in the tooling the week before, um, so newly created collections were not being added to the read alias. Since collections are created and added to the alias two days in advance, the first collection to be affected by the bug was three days ago. So we know this bug was sitting latent for a while, just a detailed summary of the incident so far. And then we have a timeline, and this is kind of doing what I talked about earlier, right? It's not the actual timeline, it's some one's summary of the timeline. In this case, it is person A's summary of the timeline. 
So they talk about the bug being introduced in the tooling. We're still not quite sure what bug it is or how it got introduced or why it got introduced. Um, December 6 collections created, newly created SKUs start going into the alias. Um, incident channel starts because we got some customer reports. Uh, the search team gets paged and begins doing work. Uh, issue with elevated error rates is a red herring. Borked broker is potential cause. Borked broker is ruled out. Misconfiguration alias is identified as the cause. Configuration is fixed. Fix is confirmed. Fix is applied. Um, this doesn't really tell me much. You know, if I, if I was a new employee on this team or a new engineer reading this, like these can actually be your richest source of onboarding. Um, but this doesn't really help me do my job better if I'm an engineer. This doesn't actually really help me unless I'm person A, probably. Um, and so the impact, all users had a degraded search experience for 20 minutes over which the incident took place. I don't really know what 20 minutes means. Is it, is it good? Is it bad? Is that a long time? Is that a short time? I'm kind of afraid to ask, right? Um, contributing factors, lack of type system or static analysis and code, alert that would have detected this is also broken. You could put these as contributing factors in any incident in the software industry. <laughs> I, I guarantee it, in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, and a lot of this is normative language, too, right? It's, it's to person A's norms, right? In, in person A's mind, there's a lack of a type system. And in person A's mind, uh, and, and this is a alert that would have, right? This is kind of counterfactual reasoning. If you see would have or should have in your incident reports, try your hardest to like figure out how to take it out. Because if it should have or if it would have, it, it would have, right? It would have happened. And that doesn't actually help people learn from what was happening. Um, what went well? Fairly quick fix once the search team stage. OK, so yeah, the, I think you know they're thinking they did well, right? But I still don't know what this 20 minutes means. Again, counterfactual reasoning alert that should have caught the misconfiguration is also broken. This kind of language is not helping the cognitive work here, right? Um, I don't quite know much about this alert uh, or the history behind it or what was happening here. Like, it's making me want to dig into this a lot more. Happened during a low traffic time and not many users were impacted. What does low traffic time mean at this organization? When are people not using the website as much? Why was it a low traffic time? When did it happen? Um, so action items. These could also be applied to any incident. <laughs> Fix the bug preventing the alias from being updated. Fix the alert that should have fired. Check all of our alerts to make them fire. And <clears throat> I'm not blaming person A here. I think they did the best they could, and I think they're probably responsible for cleaning up a lot of this too, right? And so they're not, you know, and like I mentioned, they're kind of inherently bad at teaching other people, right? Uh, and at the end of this incident review, I'm left with a ton of questions uh, that don't really help me with future incidents. And this organization is less likely to have gotten ROI out of this incident review. And I'm also seeing my time right now, so I'm going to start going a little bit fast. Um, so think about what questions you still have about incident one. Then we're going to go to investigation two. So purpose was to engage and be read, and purpose was to teach and understand how things were handled. It had an objective. No, it, the objective was not for this incident to never happen again and to have shallow action items, but it was to enroll others in the process of learning from the incident. Uh, enroll others in understanding how people communicated and how that actually contributed to the system expertise. Uh, and when this happens, good action items actually just end up falling out of this. If the goal is action items, you're going to end up with action items. They might sit on a backlog for seven years. Uh, they might be way too big. They might stress people out looking at them. But if you do things with the goal of learning, action items literally just fall out of them. And, and they're good. And they usually get done because people are more enrolled. And you're not going to have to chase them. So um, this was actually based off of the Jelly Howie Guide. It's a free resource online. It's jelly.io slash Howie. Uh, and you can see like we really went into the human aspects of the incident. Who responded? 
Um, what contributed to the incident? What, what was difficult about handling the incident? And really focused on a lot of the cognitive areas so that we could learn. Um, so the incident actually starts in the key updates channel. So what we were missing from incident number one was context. I saw no names. I saw nothing about how people communicated. It was just someone's summary of how people communicated. So we see Justin Bacon in the key updates channel. We're receiving requests right now related to the key change beta release. Uh, and this is November 23rd. The other timeline started in late December, right? So we're going back to kind of seeing actually how this configuration got detected to begin with. And it starts with Justin Bacon in a non-incident channel. So between November 23rd and November 30th, the search team received several pager-driven alerts on search not working and invalid keys created a source of confusion and fatigue for the search team. Has anyone ever been woken up in the middle of the night to alert that they did not need to respond to? Right? It's, it's a lot. So this team was getting alert stormed. We do not have that context. They were frequently getting woken up in the middle of the night because there had this been, been this big project to revoke these old keys and then they were getting you know, alerted like, oh my gosh, these keys are in error. And they're like, no, it's actually not an error. And so they finally got frustrated enough to fix it. So they introduced PR 22 on December 23rd, December 3rd to avoid the noisy alerts that the search team was getting as a result of the key changes. It was to not alert when the key was invalid. Then a partition was created to hold the indices for December 6, 2022. This is always created two days in advance. And then there was a second PR. There was a PR introduced not to update read aliases for live collections during a migration. Completely separate, two different things, but both of these things had to be, had to be done in order for the incident to actually have occurred. Um, and this was a result of a migration taking a minute longer than necessary. So someone in their PR was like, I'm here, I'll just you know, fix this little migration work while I'm here, right? Like they were doing a good thing, um, but they kept it in that same PR. And then between December 4th and December 6th, errors were detected, but there were no pages because of PR 22. And then this is where queries began not reaching the partition. Now we have a spam detection channel where customer service agent uh, Connor Jacobs happens to be online fighting bots um, from competitors that are spamming the site and trying to scrape it. Um, so he's just posting what he's doing. This is very separate. He's running some manual tests um, about you know, fighting the spam. Uh, and he does tests for add to cart, he does some manual tests for search. Um, he's not touching any of these things, it's just a thing this organization does. They, they do smoke tests regardless of what they're touching. And um, he's like, huh, a search you know, isn't returning a SKU I just added in test. That's weird. All right, I'm moving on to the second deploy. He is, just assumes he caught something weird because he didn't really touch search. Uh, now we'll go to the customer service channel where Natalie is receiving reports that we can't access search results for the promo items that were shown yesterday. Um, so now we know that there was a promo email that was sent out yesterday too. So now we have all these other teams involved. The first incident kind of looked very simple, not very complex, kind of that it only affected the search team. And very quickly, Connor recognizes, oh, I think this is an issue, right? And so they were able to coordinate really quickly. He says, I'm going to page the search team I actually can't figure out auto-paging, so I'm going to manually page, which I think pages all of them. Uh, oh, well. Uh, so he pages all of them. They actually all join. It's the middle of the night, their time. Um, and now we're kind of starting to understand why this got fixed in 20 minutes, right? Um, and, and a lot of this was due to how these people communicated. But I'm also now wondering about the power Connor Jacobs holds. And oh, he was one of the first employees, right? He knows everyone. He's been here for six years. Uh, and so if people see a page from Connor Jacobs, they're probably going to react in a certain way. Uh, and so now we're understanding about what made this incident easier, right? And this can teach us a lot about how to work with people differently in our organizations. So now we're actually in the incident channel. Um, he, Justin is saying he doesn't see messages past midnight. And because the whole search team is online, we have the authors of all the PRs that are now in the incident as well. Um, and so they update it. They fix it. We see the UG Python. I wonder what that means. Um, it makes me wonder about the language nuances of Python in this organization, the history of it as this organization, and the purposes of it. 
Um, and then we can kind of create an engaging timeline too, right? Like the first incident talked about the red herrings a little bit, it talked about the things we looked for. Um, but this, like looking at a visual timeline actually makes me want to get, dig deeper, actually wants me to ask questions about it. And you can also add things to it, like what folks were doing. Um, you know, we thought we repaired it, then we didn't repair it. Ah, we finally repaired it. And so we can see it's not this like clean delineation between we responded, we detected, we fixed it, and we can put those all in a database and like slice and dice across them to see if those numbers are changing. No, like that's not gonna help us learn. It's just gonna, it's just some artificial metrics to look at. Um, so key takeaways from this incident, there were multiple notions of what it meant for search to be working. Um, the handling accidents was influenced by team cohesiveness and collaboration. Changing code with alerts has a lot of risk. There was ease of coordination due to familiarity of the team and a really quick awareness of the issue at hand. Um, who understands a little bit more about this incident now than the first incident? Yeah? This is meant, doing things this way is meant to bring more people into the conversation, right? We got Connor, we got Natalie, we got all these people now that are now talking about the incident and how they were impacted by it. Understanding how experts think is what creates more experts. And so you can actually see the differences of like times to investigate, time of incident. We actually created Jelly to allow you to go deep like this, but to do it in a time constrained way. Uh, you can see contributing factors were different. You can see action items that got completed were different. You can see we had less people involved. You can see that 10 people read the first document and 40 people read the second document. Now we have a lot more people learning about search in this incident, right? And now actually the person that does this incident review actually becomes a really big expert in search. And so you can start to spread this out. Uh, so what's next? Um, working to understand how experts think and talk creates more experts. Working to understand how experts, uh, this is how you scale these people. And so now we get all this expertise spread out amongst our organization. So you can use more than customer impact to warrant a review. Making it engaging creates a record. And making it engaging actually makes people want to participate, which is how you get more ROI. Doing this can have a lot of value in your organization. And I will say this again, your metrics are wrong and they're lying to you. Stop making decisions based on them alone. Use communication patterns to add context. So my challenge for you is to look through previous communications and situations or incidents over the next two weeks and I guarantee you can find something interesting. Um, come find me, I'm around all day. Thank you so much.